So I am a clinical social worker and a consultant, and I've worked with many, many couples living with illness and consulted to hospice programs. And my co-author, Roann, and I interviewed many, many, many couples living with different kinds of illnesses and many experts from diverse fields. Um, and we decided to write this book because when we each went through our own illness experiences, there were no resources out there to help couples move through this illness journey together. And as, as Holly said, you know, the biggest takeaway from all of our work is that if you are part of a couple, the illness may live in one person's body, but it's two lives that are involved. Two lives that are turned in unexpected directions, and two minds and hearts and spirits that can be brought to bear um, in coping with the illness. So Roanne, when she was in her 40s, she went into the hospital for a planned heart operation, and she had a massive stroke. And when she woke, the left side of her body was completely paralyzed. And she was a mother with two young kids. Um, and she was told that uh, she should not expect to recover much, much mobility. Um, I, about 15 years ago, came down with a chronic pain condition um, and uh, manage it every day. And some days are good days and some days are bad days. Tonight is a great night and I'm delighted to be here. And I thank you all for taking the time to come and talk with, with me and with each other about this topic. So Roanne, um, within two years, she was literally playing the violin again. And if she were here, she would add as badly as ever. Um, and I have found many, many practitioners, alternative and, and um, regular healthcare practitioners who have helped me in my pain journey. Um, I would have to say that, I, well, I'm very, very grateful to all the excellent practitioners and healthcare providers who gave me great, great care. In terms of the sheer quantity of healing power, and by the way, healing doesn't mean curing. Healing can happen in many different ways, and it's not the same as curing when I use that word. So in terms of healing power, day to day, what held me up, first was my husband, Richard. This is the virtual version, and this is the human replica. But they're wearing the same shirt. <laughs> he has many of this shirt. And, and next was my dog, Mina. Some of you are nodding. Some of you have pets, cats, dogs, rabbits, turtles. So you, you know. You know what animals can give you. Um, so that's why we, we wrote this book. And in terms of how does illness affect the couple relationship, um, it's, it's not subtle. Uh, illness is like holding up a giant stop sign to your relationship. I'm going to get good at this, you know, over the shoulder. Um, most couples, especially if you've been in the relationship for a while, the, the rhythm of your relationship and your patterns are really set by your day-to-day -day habits, the chores you do each day. That becomes sort of the momentum of your relationship. So chores like uh, getting up, getting kids to school, going to work, uh, going grocery shopping, doing laundry, doing laundry, doing laundry, um, helping the kids with homework, and doing your own work, and then watching yet another episode of Law and Order, and then going to bed. Um, illness, when illness appears, it, it stops all that. It, and it derails those chores, which have been the, the drive in, in your relationship. It derails them, and the new touch points become doctors and hospitals and chemo and radiation and medication and side effects and tests and waiting and waiting for results, waiting to talk to your doctor. Um, that's 
a very big shift, and it can happen very quickly. And that's a lot for a couple to adjust to. When, um, when I got sick, when this pain condition happened, it just it hit me with a bang. And um, it felt like I had a bucket of broken glass just sloshing around inside. And I had to stop working. I didn't leave the house for almost a year. Um, Richard was my interface with, with the outside world. He dealt with the chores and he dealt with the insurance companies. And for us, it was a giant stop sign. And we were just thrown upside down. So that's, that's how strong illness can be. Um, the punchline to my whole talk, and if you take away anything from this talk, this should be it. The punchline to the talk is that, yes, illness disrupts your relationship. Yes, illness becomes the third partner in your relationship. And illness often gets to determine what you do and how you do it. And its needs can supersede the couple's needs. You know, illness can determine if you can travel, if you can socialize, if you can, what you can eat, and uh, when and if you can sleep. That's the hard side. But the punchline is, is that it's that very disturbance and turmoil that illness produces that can break through relationship barriers and bottlenecks that may have been there for years, for decades, um, and take the couple right down to the bedrock of their relationship. And so illness can just slice through irrelevancies. It can illuminate what, is, what really, really matters and what doesn't matter. And it can take you right down to your bedrock. And on that bedrock, you will find the essence of your relationship. And for most couples, that essence is compassion and love. And that is a very strong platform from which to not just survive, but grow through illness. Now, can this happen for every couple? No. No, some couples get down to their bedrock and they find that it's, it's gravel. And, and it's, it's, it's been fracked, and it's toxic. Um, and those couples may realize, because of the illuminating power of illness, they may realize that they're better off apart, and they separate. And indeed, the couples who separated that we interviewed were happier apart. Um, but as, as one of the experts we interviewed said, this was a, a Jungian analyst, and he said that lovely phrase, illness can be the jolt that removes the dullness from life and unveils the potential. Now, some of you may nod your head and may have experienced that already. And I'm going to be talking about how you as a couple uh, can unveil that potential, how you can build relationship resilience so that you have a strong platform to support each other and to deal with the healthcare system. So, of all audiences I can say this to, it's you. I have to take medication, you know, as, as many of you do, and it affects my short-term memory. So I'm gonna, from time to time, refer to my notes. You get it. <laughs> so that's the punchline, that illness can unveil the potential. I'd like to try and do a little quickie exercise with you. And I'd like to start with the ill partner. So if you are an ill partner, or if you know somebody who is an ill partner, or if you can put yourself in the mindset of the ill partner in the relationship, you know, take a second and do that. Think about the experience of the ill partner. And I want you to just call out a word, any word, verb, noun, adjective, what, any word at all, there's no right or wrong, that you think depicts something about the ill partner's experience. 
Sorry, say again? Go on. Terrified. Terrified. Lost. Lost. No, loss. 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 Okay, terrified. Terrifying loss. Anger. Anger. Fear. Fear. Lethargy. Lethargy. What else? Anxiety. Unknown. Okay, let's flip it and put yourself in the, in the frame of being the well partner, the caregiving partner. Either if you are that or know somebody or you can just imagine it. You're in the frame of the caregiving partner. Just call out a word that you think expresses something about the caregiver's experience. Frustration. Frustration. Helplessness. Hel helpless? Helplessness. 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 You were nodding your head. Was that frustration? frustration. Hope. Say again? Hope. 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 Other words, I'm going to call on people with green shirts. <laughs> Yes, that's you. <laughs> Any other words? Sadness. Sadness. Okay. These are all very powerful words. Um, and there's a lot of overlap between the, the two experiences, but there's also a lot of difference. Um, and what this says to me, hearing these words from you, is that when illness is in your life, there's a lot to hold, a lot of strong emotion to hold. And it's too much for one person to carry. And when the couple can carry all that together and work as a team, that load becomes a little bit more manageable. Um, and that's what we'll be getting to. So very important point. The impact of illness is experienced differently by the ill partner and by the well partner. By the way, I'm going to use she for the ill partner and he for the well partner because that was my experience and it just you mean he for the comes more naturally. You mean he for the caregiver? He for the caregiver. Thank you. Um, so their perceptions of the illness is different and their feelings about the illness is different. And if the couple thinks that they're going through the same thing um, and they're feeling the same way, instead of connecting, they're going to they're gonna collide and they're going to miss each other. So for the ill partner, she has suffered what I call both body loss and soul, soul loss. Her body has betrayed her and her identity has been hijacked by the illness. She's not who she was. She's not sure who she is now or will be. And there's often a, a unsettling gap between her internal image of herself, which is usually younger and healthier, and the external reality. That that's can be a painful gap. And in this, in this state, she has to rely on specialists who she doesn't really know. They may be strangers. Um, and she may not trust them yet. The well partner. The well partner, he has had his world just turned on him, um, and he's flailing. And he himself is feeling anger, loss, sadness, everything that you said. Um, and he's also feeling a tremendous sense of helplessness at having to witness and stand by and witness his sweetie suffer. Um, in addition, he may be feeling anger and resentment at the healthcare system, at doctors, at family members who aren't doing enough, and even at the ill partner for getting ill. And, and on top of that, he may feel guilty for feeling those feelings. So it gets very convoluted. And here's a scenario that one of the couples uh, shared with us that can happen if the partners don't recognize that their experiences are different. So she, the ill partner, 
she decides she needs some alone time uh, in order to just sit with what she's going through and process it. He is driven to help her. He wants to do everything he can to help her. She feels his attempts to help her as intrusions because she wants alone time. He feels her need for alone time as rejection. And what happens then is she clings even more tightly to her alone time. And he ramps up his attempts to help. And the spiral just keeps going. Now, fast forward, you know, this is a couple who um, is aware that their experiences are different. So she instead says to him, honey, it's always a good word to start your request with, honey, um, I need some alone time to just feel what I'm going through. And um, it won't take too long. I need some alone time. And just know that you're with me. I'm not rejecting you, but I need some alone time. He can then say, I understand. I respect your right to have some privacy, but know that I'm worried about you all the time. So I'm going to need to check in maybe once or twice. And I hope that won't disturb you. So what they're doing in the second scenario is they are recognizing that there are differences. They're respecting their differences. And at the same time, they're maintaining their connection. Another way in which their experiences are different is that very often, and I, my guess is that many of you have experienced this, the pre-illness relationship was a relationship of equals. With illness, that shifts, and it becomes more a relationship of patient and caregiver. And the patient is dependent, and the caregiver um, has to provide. That's a big shift, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a, in a minute. But when that happens, the focus is primarily on the patient. She gets the attention, and the caregiver, the caregiver has needs and they may be recognized, but very, very often they're just not even, not even asked about their needs. So there was one man um, who, uh, his wife was in the hospital getting her chemo and he went out to sit in a hallway and he was sitting down on the floor with his head in his hands and silent tears were coming down his cheeks. And a doctor walked by and put his hand on his shoulder, and th this man looked up, hopefully, and the doctor said, no, don't you cry. You have to be strong for her. And he felt kicked in the gut. You know, he felt invisible um, and like he didn't matter. And he felt even lower than he had felt when he left the room. And it was that extra burden that he was going to be taking back into the room to be with his wife. Now imagine if that doctor or anybody had come over, patted him on the shoulder, and just simply said, I know this is hard for you too. I'm really sorry. It wouldn't have made his sadness go away, but he would have felt validated and recognized. And he would have felt a little bit more stronger to carry his feelings back into the room and be stronger, indeed be stronger for his wife. And that's not just something that healthcare providers can do for caregivers. We all can. Um, anyone you know who's a caregiver, just a pat on the shoulder. Um, Richard describes caregivers as belonging to a secret society that nobody knows about. Um, you know, if you, if you have a baby and you go into work, you're tired, you look haggard, you're not focused, and people laugh and they kind of say, uh, you know, pat you on the back and they say, rough night, huh? And they know what your experience is. If you're a member of the secret society of caregivers and you go into work and you're tired and you look haggard and you're not focused, nobody knows why. And they're not very forgiving. They don't know that you were up all night, you know, helping your, your partner get to the bathroom four or five times. Um, so it's a, it's a secret society. And Richard actually knows the secret handshake. So if any of you want to learn it, <laughs> see him afterward. 
I had the experience of belonging to that society. I've been the patient for 15 years. I got used to being the patient. Um, I got used to being taken care of. Um, and then Richard, about a year and a half ago, had open heart surgery, and I had to be the caregiver. And I, I, was, I was happy to help him get in and out of bed and move around the house and prepare healthy meals and monitor his Coumadin levels. But I found it almost unbearable, the helplessness of watching him suffer and not being able to do anything. And so that word, helplessness, is I think one that resonates very much with, with caregivers. Thank you for your understanding. Okay, so how else does illness affect the couple relationship? Um, there are two big areas that get disrupted. One is roles, as we alluded to, and the other is communication. When it comes to roles, the shift from being a partnership of equals to being a relationship of patient and caregiver, for some couples, it's a game changer. I'm gonna tell you two stories. One story, a man in his mid-50s, um, he and his wife married when they were 20, and a year later, she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and it was the kind that rapidly degenerated. And he had been the caregiver for 30 years, and as she got worse, he took on more daily living kinds of activities on her behalf. So he, he um, re-architected the house so it was wheelchair accessible. He basically raised their two daughters um, he did the cooking. As she got more debilitated, he would bathe her and wash her hair and dry her hair and dress her. Um, and when he turned around 50, he decided he did not want to be celibate anymore. He decided that he wanted to have the sexual part of his being find a way to, to be expressed and to be satisfied. So he found a sexual partner outside of their relationship. And he continued to be caregiver for her. And you might think that he had to look elsewhere because she wasn't physically able to have sex, but that, that wasn't why. The truth is that this shift from caregiver, from equals to caregiver and patient, just undid their relationship. Her primary relationship became with her illness. And his primary relationship was as caregiver. And if you're a caregiver to a patient, you don't have sex with that person. So that was a boundary he couldn't cross. So for them, it was a game changer. Another example on another side of the spectrum of how a couple dealt with this shift in roles. Um, the wife had was in a car accident, she had a lot of things that were going wrong, and she also had some traumatic brain injury. And um, she needed help doing, doing daily living activities. And her husband said to her, I'm not going to help you with any of that. He decided he was not going to be the caregiver, that he wanted to be the guardian of their adult relationship, so that when she got better, and he had hope that she would get better, um, they, they would not have that legacy of patient caregiver to undo. And she was furious at him for not helping her until she started to get better. And then she realized that he had made the right choice for them, that he had protected their adult intimate relationship. So all this is to say that Serious illness, chronic illness, doesn't come with a rule book. You make it up as you go along. There's no right way. What's right for one couple might not be right for another couple. But there is benefit in at least hearing other couples' stories and hearing how they did it and seeing and taking ideas from that. But there is no rule book, and we just do the best that we can do every day, don't we? We just do the best that we can do. So communication, how does it affect your communication? 
uh, when illness comes into the picture, almost immediately there is just a whirlwind of feelings that are swirling around. Many of them you mentioned. Sadness, anger, um, fear, worry, frustration, rage. Um, and these feelings uh, are very powerful and naturally it, it's, it's hard for the couple to know what to do with them. And many couples, in fact most couples, keep them quiet. They put them in a box. They silence them or they try to silence them out of fear that if they were to speak about these hard negative feelings, it might cause harm. It might, it might just unleash um, an endless fountain of, of pain and misery. Um, so they, they collude in keeping silent. But keeping these feelings silent and quiet doesn't make them go away. It just pushes them down, um, kind of underground. And they don't go away, they continue to grow. And they become somewhat subversive. And they come out. Um, I'm going to tell you about one couple. This is from the book In Sickness and in Health. I'm going to read something about one couple who learned that speaking these feelings aloud doesn't destroy the relationship. It strengthens the relationship, even though it's frightening to do. During the year that Francis and Ted were in therapy, they learned to recognize their own emotions and to appreciate the subtle and volatile ways their feelings could intertwine and ignite. They learned how to communicate with honesty about their needs and with empathy for each other's feelings. They learned to speak the unspeakable. That was the phrase they used, to speak the unspeakable. Francis, however, continued to deteriorate. Her pain and exhaustion were debilitating. She spent a year making the rounds of doctors and specialists to no avail. She took a leave of absence from work and stopped going out with friends. Most nights, Ted held her as she cried in frustration and pain. Trapped in agony with no answers, Frances began to secretly contemplate suicide. The past was over, the present was unbearable, and the future held no promise of relief. Ironically, in her desperate state, the contemplation of suicide became her only ray of hope. But she did not think she could share it with Ted. She hated keeping the secret from Ted, but she feared this was one unspeakable that he could not handle. This was consuming her more and more and more, to tell or not to tell, until there was no room left for connecting with Ted. And she felt lonelier and suicide became more of, of, a, of an option. After struggling with this alone for several weeks, Frances realized that as hard as it would be for Ted to hear, she had to share her fantasies about a suicidal cure with him. She invited him into the living room. They sat side by side, and she simply said, I have been thinking about suicide. The moment the words came out of her mouth, her body relaxed. After years of practice at empathic communication, Ted did not react by discounting or challenging her feelings. He did not say, no, you can't do that. You don't know what you're saying. He looked into her eyes and calmly said, you've clearly been hurting for a long time, physically and emotionally. I can understand that you would think about suicide. Any normal person in your situation would. Tell me about it. They talked for the next two hours, and every time Francis came to a halt, Fred just said, tell me more, until she emptied herself. When she stopped, they held one another and cried together. The misery became a shared pain joining them, and no longer a secret burden keeping them apart. Feeling her world uplifted by Ted's strength and compassion, Frances no longer needed to hold on to suicide as her only liberator. They both knew it was an option, but they could place it outside the space they had just created. Available if needed, but not overpowering their spirit. 
That's a very strong example of speaking the unspeakable. But that technique of sitting down in a quiet time set aside with no interruptions and one person talks and the other one listens and just keeps saying, tell me more, tell me more, without attempting to respond or to solve any problems. That, that ability to empty into someone's empathic arms is very, very powerful. That's, that's an approach that you all might want to think about trying. So what can a couple do to build resilience in their relationship? The first thing is to really support each other. Um, and given the whirlwind of emotions that illness brings into your relationship, it's easy to forget about supporting each other. You can be so consumed with the minutia of the illness and medication and chemo and radiation and doctor's appointments and drugs that you don't carve out time to just focus on each other. So to support each other, it's not about me giving you a checklist of the five supportive things you can say. It's about you building a platform, a support platform, a platform that's built on that bedrock of love and compassion. And from that platform, you will just naturally reach out to each other. So I'm going to try an exercise with you. This is a silent exercise, another one. It's called sitting in silence. Um, and the way that couples do it is they find a time where they won't be interrupted and they pick a time, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and they just sit in silence. And in that silence, what they do is they, they summon, they conjure up memories of joyous experiences that they shared. They conjure up feelings of love and compassion. They conjure up the respect they have for each other. They conjure up the values that they share. So I'm going to ask you to just close your eyes. We're just going to do this for a minute. Go ahead, you can close your eyes. <laughs> and in that quiet place, breathe quietly. I want you to just think about, think about your partner. Summon love for that person. Remember joyous moments that you shared. Appreciate who that person is. Okay, you can open your eyes and just breathe. There's no sharing after you do this. This is yours. This is private. This is yours. You don't share it with me or with anybody else, but you can carry it with you. And from that place, there will be a natural gesture of outreach to your partner. Okay, the other thing that couples can do is practice what's called active coping. And active coping doesn't mean thinking happy thoughts. Active coping means two things. It means as much as possible, make choices and decisions at every point along the illness journey. So much is wrested from your control Take control wherever you can and make choices. And the other thing active coping means is trying to stay as close to normal as possible, what you think of as, as, as normal. So if the illness is light, normal might mean uh, going on a trip, it might mean socializing, it might mean, it might mean getting together with family and friends. If the illness is in a, in a heavier phase, you can, as one couple did, where uh, he had pancreatic cancer and there were times when um, he was bedridden. And what they did is they chose to be as close to normalcy as possible. And what that meant is they moved his bed just about into the kitchen so that he could be, 
He could be in any state he needed to be in, but he could hear the normalcy of his family doing their thing in the kitchen, and he could feel comforted by that. So staying as close to normal as possible and making choices. One area where choice making becomes very, very important is in your interactions with the healthcare system. And my guess is that here at Stanford Health um, and in this support program that um, your experience is probably not as dark as the experience of some other people we talk to who don't have as enlightened a healthcare system. And you may have even run into some, for lack of a better term, jerks um, in your healthcare journey also. Um, but it becomes very important to challenge the doctor, um, to question a medical recommendation, and it's really hard to do that alone. Um, if Richard hadn't been in, 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 at an appointment with me, um, I would have had an unnecessary spinal tap because I wouldn't have had the strength to say, what, why do I need a spinal tap? But together, we could, we could turn it into a choice, and it was the right choice. Um, so here's how, here's how one couple actively coped. As Don and Robert learned how complicated and demanding Don's illness was, they also realized that for them to get the care Don needed, they would have to take the initiative. They would have to be their own advocates in the healthcare system. For Don and Robert, the first step was to gather information about Don's condition and learn who had the expertise they needed. Don asserted, I will not have a passive relationship with my doctors. I am not at the mercy of my medical team. They work for me. I am in charge. I get to make the decisions. To take responsibility for your own health care is a fundamental component of active coping. And as I said, it's very hard to do solo. So work as a team together um, to, to make choices. So during one hospitalization, an intern was about to dispense a change in the medication Don had been taking successfully for many years for another condition. Don told him, you can't do this. I am not just a body. I insist on being in this process as a partner. This is non-negotiable. You don't just do stuff to me. Get my doctor up here. Later that day, the department head came into Don's room and thanked him. We need to be reminded of this, he said. One very important part of active coping and and being a proactive patient, or as, as one of my colleagues calls it, being an e-patient, an empowered patient, is, is accurate information sharing. Um, and that's two ways. When you're speaking with your doctor, you need to make sure that you both understand what the doctor's saying, because you're both gonna come at it from different perspectives, and both those perspectives are really important. Um, and it's also about giving the doctor accurate information about your state. So there was one woman we interviewed, uh, and she said that when she went to see her doctor on a good day, she might remember 30% of what she said for maybe two days. So she started bringing her partner with her, and, and the partner became the memory. And the partner also took notes, and the partner sometimes taped it on his iPhone, but the partner was able to be, be, to be the brain for both of them when it came to memory. Um, also, when the doctor would ask her, how are you doing, and have you been doing since our last appointment, she would say, oh great, I'm doing great. And the husband would say, yeah, you are doing great, that's terrific, but you know, you really haven't been sleeping very well, and." I think you've lost five pounds. And the woman would say, yeah, that's true, but I'm doing great. So the partner sometimes has a more accurate perspective um, of 
change in status over a period of time. Because for the ill partner, it's, 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 a, it's an internal feeling, and the partner, the well partner, is observing. Um, my timekeeper is showing me I've got three minutes left. Uh, you've got more time, actually. Yeah? Because that's just, okay. that was just a guideline. Okay. See, this is how we work as a team. <laughs> And actually, it's true. I am, I am more feeling-driven. Richard is more data-driven. We fit into that stereotype. So he was definitely a more accurate reporter of, of, of incremental changes in my state from one visit to another. Um, ah, the th third area where couples can build resilience. Someone, used, someone called out the word hope. Very important. Um, where couples can support each other and build relationship resilience. There's been a lot of research done on hope and, and positive thinking and its effect on one's physiology. And some of that research shows that when you're in a state of hopefulness, that um, it affects your nervous system in such a way that it can create an optimum environment for uh, repair and it can affect your, your respiratory system and your circulatory system and your motor system. They also have found that being in a state of hopefulness, um, your, your, your brain releases um, endorphins and enkephalins, which mimic, the, uh, which mimic morphine. It has the same effect of, as morphine on your body, and so that becomes um, important in pain reduction. Um, now, I am not saying, you know, and this is in like bold neon letters, I am not saying, that, that's the code for not saying, not the secret handshake, that's the code. I am not saying that um, happy thoughts uh, keep you healthy and, and negative thoughts make you sick and if you could only think happy thoughts then you'd be fine. You know, if only it were that simple, you know, if only. But that is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that Creating hope feels good. And when you are in a state of hope, you feel lighter, you feel more motivated. And that can then lead to additional benefits. And hope, hope is not like a shiny penny on the floor that you just happen to stumble on and pick up. And say, now, see, I found hope. Hope is something that you actively create anywhere, anytime, under any set of circumstances. I realize that might sound strange, but really, under any set of circumstances. And very often, and this is my experience and also the experience of many of the ill partners we spoke to, they lost the directions to hope. You know, after three or four or five months of trying to get the right treatment and then the, the rigor of the treatment, they just lost the directions to hope. And often it was the well partner who could hold the hope for the couple. There was one woman who every once in a while would go to her, her, her husband and say to him, can you tell me about hope? And he would share his perspective on that they could, there's still more things to try and um, look what you're able to do and I have hope for you and come let me hold you honey. Got to throw the word honey in there. Um, so here's what one couple did. to bring hope and choice into their experience. This is the same couple. This is the man who had uh, pancreatic cancer. Chuck and Robin, in deciding to pursue hope, even in the face of an, an incurable illness, were making a life-affirming choice. Instead of allowing the misery of a dire prognosis to contaminate other areas of their life, they made the conscious choice to strengthen the areas of normalcy and love and keep their focus on healing, what could be healed. The power of the fear that attaches to illness is so overwhelming, it can easily diminish any potential for joy. It takes conscious effort to cultivate hope. One way to choose hope is to focus on the present moment. The feared prognosis lives in the future and may or may not happen. 
the potential for a healing of the mind, the spirit, and the body, and the relationship occurs in every present moment. Living in the fear of the future does nothing to prevent the future from happening and only consumes one's inner resources in the attempt. It is only in the present that you can have direct impact. The present offers you limitless opportunities for choosing to hope that you can cherish life, strive for joy, and deepen love. Even within the sadness of illness, you can hope to find an acceptance of mortality, which can then spark a profound appreciation for the gifts you have at hand now. And finally, I want to read you what one man said. He also had cancer. Um, this to me is, is another punchline to this talk. The first punchline was that illness could be the jolt that unveils the potential. The power of hope is also another punchline. So this is what he said spontaneously as we interviewed him. It was so elegant. He said, there's always something to be hopeful about. When you have health, you can be hopeful about having any of your dreams come true. Once your body fails you, you can rest your hope in your emotions. You can hope that you will still feel love and compassion for others and for yourself. If your emotions become emptied, you still have your spirit, and you can hope to connect to something greater than yourself, something that has a light to shine on your shadow. And when the spirit is gone, then you have become something else, and who knows what hope awaits you there. Isn't that beautiful? So, We talked about how, hope, how illness becomes the third partner in your relationship and how its needs can sometimes take over and it can be a giant stop sign halting what used to be comfortable and it takes a while to figure out the, the new normal. We talked about how the experience is different for each partner and that it's really important to recognize that difference so that you can connect instead of kind of missing each other or colliding. And we talked about ways that you could build relationship resilience. Important one is creating that platform where you're dipping into your essence of compassion and love and supporting each other from that essence. And we talked about active coping. Active coping in terms of staying as close to normal as possible and making choices at every point along the way and coping actively with the healthcare system and realizing that you're the boss and enlisting your partner in doing that because it's hard to do that alone. And also, and finally, in creating hope. That's, that's the gist of my talk. Um, there are a few slides that I, we have prepared for you as handouts. They're just kind of summary slides, more like checklist slides. Um, about managing your own health care. Um, we found that uh, my keeping my own case history and asking for copies of test results and scans was very useful as I went from doctor to doctor. And ask questions until you completely understand. And if you leave the room and you realize you didn't understand something, then make sure you have that doctor's email address so you could ask them. That became actually a criteria for us in choosing a doctor. Will you give me your email address? Managing the illness together. Think in terms of chunks. What, what are my goals for this week, this month, this season? Don't think in terms of the whole spread. Just think in terms of chunks of time and ask for help. And, and there are many, many resources I, I point to, to Holly. Um, there are many amazing resources out there that can support you um, emotionally and also practically. Doing your laundry, you know, you can have a, a meal chain where your friends and neighbors bring you meals if that's if that's what you want, and make choices. Turn things into choices wherever possible. And in terms of the relationship. I think the most important thing here, two most important things, is set aside time. It's so easy for the illness to just 
wash over everything. Sc reclaim time to sit and tell each other what's going on. And, ask, and each, when each person talks, the other one says, tell me more, and listens with empathy. Or you sit in silence for five minutes and think about your connection to this other person. Set aside time, that's really important. And caretakers, take care of yourselves. That's essential, because that feeling of helplessness can be so overwhelming. Do things that build you so that you can retain your strength. Tell people how you sometimes kicked me out of a house to go <laughs> visit my friends. and Tell people that. That was important. Um, when, I, when I first got sick and the broken glass was sloshing around, I, I knew this was not going to be a quick fix. And I knew it was also going to be very intense for both of us. And I said to Richard, get thee to a therapist. Um, and he did. He, he started seeing a therapist. And I knew that that was important because um, I was no longer able to be his emotional receiver. You know, I couldn't support him anymore in that way. I was too broken. And I knew that he would need that kind of support elsewhere because I wasn't going to be able to give it to him. And I also insisted that he, he go back and start doing his Taekwondo again. And he, next month, he is going to be testing for his third degree black belt. Good luck is right. <laughs> Good luck. Um, anything else? Yes. The other thing you did was you send me out at least once a week to go have dinner with a friend or just to go have fun on my own. Right. Say it repeated. So ah, yes. The other thing I did was to send you out to go have dinner with a friend once a week um, or do go to a cafe and just sit by yourself and read a book. Um, and those are the ways that if you have that platform that comes from your bedrock, it just becomes natural to, to attempt to support each other and take care of each other in, in small ways. Even just saying, you know, thank you, or, or saying, as, as that doctor didn't say, saying, I know this is hard for you too. <laughs>